Hi and welcome everyone. The US uh, 2020 election in November was a major milestone in American history and indeed have an impact on the entire world. Rarely has a single event had such an unprecedented focus by everyone. VizRT, a media cluster company that, as The Guardian put it, a collection of Norwegian whiz kids, has been both the most visible part of the election and also a part that very few know about. So today, to shine a light on VizRT's role of driving the innovation of how broadcasters cover the elections, I am joined by VizRT's co-founder, Petter Ole Jakobsen, and the head of brand and content, Chris Black. So Chris, I've heard some pretty big numbers uh, about uh, the viewers and broadcasters that covered the election using VizRT. Could you tell us your estimates? Right. So we, uh, of course, we have hundreds of bro uh, customers all over the world. And look, going back and looking at who are the customers that are going to be most likely, the broadcasters most likely to cover the U.S. elections, um, we had, uh, we found around 115 international broadcasters. But in reality, it's much, much more than that. It's hundreds and hundreds of broadcasters that are covering this as a story all over the world. Um, we know that we have an international audience of people that are using VizRT or watching customers that are using VizRT tools of around 4 billion people. So this single event, this one uh, day election that's being covered by all of their customers all over is probably most likely being seen by 4 billion people. So that's a quite heady number to think about. Oh, that is uh, quite impressive, I must say. Uh, Petar, I, I know that you have a special place in your heart for the elections. It's like Christmas and everything to you. Is, it, is that correct? It is, it is. And uh, I think, um, but I think my body is calibrated for 24 hours of <laughs> election. This took a week. And uh, my wife is still wondering if I can come out of this bubble, but it's been, it's been fantastic. Just uh, a wonderful bubble to live in uh, during this COVID time. COVID times, yes. Uh, but, but what is VizRT's role in this election? So, I mean, first of all, the, what, what you see on the screen behind you during this uh, interview is just some few examples from uh, broadcasters from the US, but also from the whole international community. Um, so. We are, we are, as Chris said, uh, we are used by everyone. And what we are used for is uh, in a very brief thing, everything you see on this screen, except for the anchors and some physical desks in the, um, in the studios, meaning we are doing the background for it. We are doing the graphics in front of the uh, anchors. We are doing the information bar on the bottom, all of it, what you see here. Yeah. It's impressive. Could you elaborate a little, a little yeah, bit? Yeah, so you know, if we look at the elections and how they are being used to, or how broadcasters are using us to cover the elections, you see the obvious things. You see, of course, like Petter said, the graphics in front. You see the uh, AR graphics, all these beautiful things, uh, visualizing the different numbers. But then there's everything behind the scenes as well. There is the ability for the director to cut between cameras, to play mm -hmm. video, all of these things are still being controlled by VizRT tools through automation, through media asset management, and of course, all the beautiful graphics that you see. So it is really an all-encompassing production that is being driven by the software that we create. And, and this has been, a, a, we have to say, a special election. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as we are talking now, it's, it's still not finished. The results are seemly clear, but still not. Uh, so it's it's quite unique. Uh, but what are you also seeing from, from the VizRT perspective? What's unique about this election? I think uh, uh, what, what struck me the most during this election, beyond the fact that it has been systems have been used not for 24 hours, but for weeks now for the same mm. thing, is that the, we can see that the, uh, the broadcasters are using the system in such a much more mature way it's become more coherent, more elegant, more focused on actually conveying information to uh, the audience than ever before. So I think it's the, uh, the uh, some will say there's too much information. I don't think so. I think they've been very good at conveying something that is very complex to a huge number of people in that. So the uniqueness, I think, is that it's all coming together 
and the our customers is treating it beautifully. Mm. Uh, as you know, you maybe know, uh, TV2 helped uh, start Visrt in uh, in 1997, and the first, the very first time Visrt went on air was actually for the 1997 Norwegian election. So let's take a look. Spending is digit. 338 percent and tilbakegang på 3,1 percent Socialistisk Vänsterparti tog 7,2 procent, tillbaka 0,7 procent. Vad ska vi säga si till detta, mina herrar? Ja, det betyder att. Uh, then here you actually will see that they are using virtual set from the get go. We have dynamic data in it, and you see also a virtual window on the wall there. So all of these things is carry on forward. Presentera och där är över 86 procent poststämmer. Okay, so that was interesting, and obviously a lot has changed uh, since then. So, so Peter and Chris, uh, how has the election coverage evolved since this clip? No, I, I, I think that the, uh, the, the, there are several things that happened, of course. In, in, the, in, the, in the backdrop of everything is that we have gotten higher and higher resolution of things, which has allowed mm. the broadcaster to do much more information on the, uh, on the screens. So that possibility has come to fruit now with what we see. And some of the things to notice in, uh, in the, compared to previous is that in more or less all broadcasters, the big video walls like this one has become one of the major, if not the major way to convey uh, information. So the video walls has become extremely important. Some are even putting them on the floor. So uh, maybe in a few years we will have just video walls to immerse yourself in. Um, one of the other things have been, uh, which is equally clear that has uh, come about is the use of AR or augmented reality in where you put uh, graphics within a physical set. It can be seen as a bar coming up in front of the anchor or anything thereof. That has become very popular and uh, it's a very good way to convey information directly to, to the viewers. And then perhaps third one, which is maybe not that visually striking, but equally prevalent, is the lower part of the screen, which now has taken on forms of being information systems in themselves in that. And if you watch some of the bigger broadcasts are you, and try to notice how much information that is conveyed on that lower part of the screen, you'll be, uh, it's, it's very interesting. I think these are, these are some of the, the, uh, the major events, which also will be, used going forward yeah and still though it's all about the storytelling it's still about bring being able to bring out the results of that election so when we saw in that 1997 clip they were using some data some graphs to be able to show uh what the results are and we're still doing that today it's just being done in a much maybe grander way uh a bit more complex but it's still all about that core information and getting that information to the audience mm. Can it ever be too much? Maybe a stupid question, but... No, I, I think it can be too much if it's not well thought out, mm -hmm. how they right. present it, yeah. right? Yeah. So these, these and things... And aligned with the story. And yeah. The, yeah, and, and uh, sometimes uh, we've been... Uh, been, uh, been uh, uh, we had a problem in the sense that people were using it maybe not more for a gimmick rather than for conveying information. I think you didn't see anything of that. Uh, mm. this year. Mm. It was this strict focus on trying to explain the audience what is going on in what is a very complex um, election. And especially as it goes on for days yeah. and how do you evolve that story and, and keep your, your viewers? Can you imagine how yeah. election coverage would have been without these tools right. over a week? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it would have been very hard for them to drive this forward in, uh, in the pace it needs. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, is there anyone, uh, Petter, that, uh, that you credit for, for driving a lot of the innovation we see in, in the election coverage? There, there, there's definitely there's one guy that, that uh, really um, uh, sticks out. I will say that, uh, that from the, uh, the first election we did in the US was in, uh, in uh, 1998. And um, uh, we had a guy there, which was Steve Jacobs, which I have to mention in that. Not maybe, I don't know if many knows him, but he was really in the leading edge of this. But in the, in the last uh, decade, there's one guy that really uh, sticks out. And uh, this is a guy that we met for the first time when he took on the job as 
Washington bureau chief, uh, which is both an editorial and, for that matter, a technical role. And he basically revamped CNN's election uh, night completely. Mm. And uh, uh, one of the things he did was basically to make sh to, to show the world that video wall is going to be a thing of the future by doing the election on the Nasdaq using all the screens they had mm. uh, there, which which really set the pace for video walls going forward. But it didn't stop there. When he had done the hologram for CNN, which was also him, David Borman, then uh, he thought he probably had to fix another TV station. So he then mm. did the next election for NBC and completely revamped how they looked. Um, uh, so done that, I'm so happy to see that. Now he's gone to, which was our first US customer, CBS, and redone their election coverage mm. this time, which ended up looking great. So this guy has uh, done more in the US part of, of uh, election coverage than anyone I can think of. And his influence also goes, of course, to countries uh, elsewhere. So he, he has a huge impact on what we have seen this time. And maybe we just could j just uh, elaborate a little bit about uh, this uh, this hologram, CNN hologram. I think a few people have heard of that. Yeah. So the, the, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions of that, but the the uh, the hologram, uh, which when it was announced that CNN did a hologram, which was their words, uh, it got a lot of uh, reactions. You know, mm, uh, many nerdy reactions that it's not really a hologram. And true enough, it wasn't a real hologram, but it was goddamn close to it. Mm. Because what was the funny story here is that uh, what ended up with being a journalist, uh, Jessica Jelin and a rapper, Will I Am, ending up as a hologram in, in CNN studio was intended, and few people know this, it was intended to be the president elect. Mm. So they built two capture studios for each place where the, uh, the potential president would be because we didn't know who would win <laughs> at that time uh, either. And um, uh, CIA was very bothered with this because we constructed a small room with 30 cameras, which the president-elect was supposed to mm -hmm. get into and be filmed by these 30 cameras, generating a 3D model of that person in real time mm -hmm. and texturing him in real time. And that is the closest hologram as you can get to. Mm -hmm. The way it was displayed and used at CNN then it was no longer technically a hologram, but it was done like that. So you mm. could move cameras around him mm. in uh, mm. there with the camera in the studio actually affecting which views that was given back from the from the guy there. Now, the thing was that this didn't work. Um, that's um, <laughs> so the the uh, the uh, and we had said that up front with uh, David, who is the who is the, the one who wanted this. We told him before we can't make we can't be sure that this this thing is going to work, you know. And, uh, mm. But uh, well, we'll 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 do it anyway. And brave as he is, the first time this thing actually worked was when he decided to put it on air. <laughs> <laughs> so a and bit it, of luck there, <laughs> and it got on air. And, yeah. And uh, there is another thing in it. And uh, at that time, I doubt if that would have happened today. It looked much. It didn't look as good as it was because they artificially put a halo around the, mm. the mm. person that mm. was teleported in order to show the viewers that this is fake. Mm. <laughs> so had he not done it, you wouldn't actually have been able to see that the person was not in the, in the studio. Mm. So this is probably the most expensive election uh, seconds <laughs> ever done. <laughs> and never used again. You agree, in Chris? That way. Well, you know, the, the funny thing about this is we did this in 2008. Yeah. And now in 2020, uh, we're doing this again in a completely different way mm -hmm. and much simpler, much more cost effective. It's sure. not outrageously expensive mm -hmm. and complex. Uh, and now the time has kind of come for it because uh, with COVID and everything, we can't travel around. So we brought the hologram back now, we're calling it teleportation. <laughs> and uh, in 2008, this was when Obama was elected. And then mm. we just saw just recently Obama sitting down with Oprah teleporting, basically using what we pioneered back then. And uh, Eurosport is using it to bring athletes into the studio every week. So 
the time in 2020 <laughs> yes. has finally come for yes. what we uh, were toying around with in 2008. I'm sure David is, what did I tell you guys? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it, it, it's absolutely fascinating. Mm. It's really it's some story. So uh, elections have really become a spectacle. And we at NZ Media, we were actually in Times Square, New York, during the 2018 election. And uh, I have to say, for a place that is always uh, quite bright, it was nearly blinding with all the broadcasters uh, taking up nearly every square meter of video space on Times Square. So uh, have elections uh, always been uh, such a large, well, show, Chris? Yeah, you know, we, uh, Petra and I actually were talking to a journalist a few weeks ago, and that got us looking into what is the history of election coverage. Um, you know, uh, the newspapers were the big ones that were covering news mm -hmm. uh, elections before television and radio. And that's when we first started seeing the election become sort of a media spectacle. When people were standing outside of the newspaper offices waiting to hear the results of different elections, mm. especially in the United States. Mm. So the newspaper started putting up projection screens and putting up the results there, putting up humorous little comics and things like that, and they would grow audiences. And then that evolved into various different experimentation with like spotlights showing which way the country was leaning. And then first radio broadcast was uh, for elections. And then uh, what we see now today with massive AR, like in uh, Dubai, where they're taking over an entire lake with a map of the US. So it's, it's been a spectacle for a long time. Of course, it is something that if you're an American, it mm -hmm. impacts you very closely because this is not just a presidential election. This is an election for voting for every different party down the ranks of American life, down to the sheriff, the mayor, the governor, mm -hmm. et cetera. So it has an impact on everybody and everybody can kind of feel that. So seeing how people cover this it's, uh, it brings out emotion. Mm. And that's something the broadcasters have been and the media companies have been pulling on since really the very beginning of mass media coverage of elections. Mm. And, and I think if I may add to that, I mean, I think the, the uh, one thing that's been consistent throughout the history is that all these, um, these um, uh, organizations, the media organizations, have experimented with new things mm. just around mm. elections. Right, like you mentioned the projection thing, right? And you, uh, on the, in the TV history of things, when CBS first started using computers, that became a big thing of mm. uh, of the television that they managed to do that. And this has this has moved on like this consistently, is still going on. Is that when election comes, that's the time when they are really can experiment and do something that they don't need to do every day. They also got extra funding. They don't have to be sure that it runs every day. So election has become the time when the customer can do their innovation. And they've been doing that. So, so um, I can love election for many things for, because I'm interested in it and because it looks great, but maybe mostly because this is the time when we together with our customers can do new things. Mm. Uh, absolutely. And I have to add on a personal note that that just being at Times Square on election night and, and looking at all these thousands of screens, knowing that all this comes from the Norwegian media cluster, that's also quite a yeah. emotional... Uh... And I, I was there the, uh, the first time Obama was elected mm. at yeah. Times Square. And the emotions on there. You know, the mixed yeah. emotion where you have so many happy people, some are crying. I nearly cried too, <laughs> mostly because of seeing us being on all right. the screens. But yeah, yeah. yeah just amazing. Uh, I was also there um, at Times Square when, um, when uh, Donald Trump won his election. Mm -hmm. It wasn't quite the same mood, I would say. There were some differences. I remember you could actually <laughs> hear a needle drop. Yeah. It could. was so quiet. Yeah. And it all the screen. Yeah. Yeah. It was a different, uh, different type of emotions. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Um, the productions are very complex, uh, so so we want to look into how are broadcasters managing to up the ante for each election and uh, sort of still keep it manageable from the production side. And so this is something I, we touched on a little bit at the beginning, um, where all the different tools that they're using to actually produce these shows, I and mean, they are extremely complex shows mm -hmm. where you have 
to time the AR with what's happening in the video wall, uh, changing cameras, uh, being able to bring in remote guests from all over the place, mm -hmm. and of course, all of the graphics that are going in front of the screen. All of these are happening simultaneously. And they mm -hmm. do have large crews that are helping put all of this together. But one of the, the key pieces of technology that is making it possible to be able to do production this complex is automation. Yeah. Um, and you know, TV2 created a company a few years ago called Mozart that VizRT ended up uh, purchasing. Well, now we have Viz Mozart. And Mozart had a big part in the coverage of the U.S. elections this year with a number of our customers. And it's very simple. It's, uh, it's mm -hmm. essentially tying everything that's happening in the studio together with a basic scene that a director, once it's set to properly, you can just hit one button. Lights change, cameras change, uh, the graphics change, everything just happens. Uh, but all of that comes with very, very, very careful planning. Um, but I think with this election, I, we're seeing all of these different technologies come into maturity because they've been tried out, they've been experimented with in the different elections. Mm -hmm. And then uh, working on them between the elections, and now we have this really nicely composed uh, product from all of these customers where they're using that automation, they're using the video walls and the AR and the graphics to just create something beautiful and do it in what feels like a natural, easy presentation. Mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, to add to that, there's one, one other distinct thing where, which I'm sure the viewers have noticed is that the, the narrative is also, I mean, there's, the, the, there is not the thing you can plan uh, along here of what's going to happen. You need to plan for what is possible to happen, but you can't say that. But uh, it's also another thing and is that the narrative is driven by the touchscreen, if you notice that. So more or less, I think more or less nearly all of our customers were using touchscreen driven things here, which helps describe what happens as it happens instead of a pre-planned mm -hmm. thing when, uh, when uh, new things happens. And I think that works superbly well to help convey the story. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, Chateau Dalla at uh, TV2 did a fantastic, fantastic job with that. The, the design team at TV2 built a very nice scene, mm. which basically gave Chateau the ability to choose how he wanted to tell the story, because he had a lot of flexibility in there. And so he could just walk onto the studio, and he had the live data coming in, but he also had the ability to change the data and trigger it in different ways. Looking at the touchscreen, he could also drive the AR. And by giving the journalist that kind of storytelling flexibility, they can just go in there and spend as much time as needed. Yeah, that was, that yeah. was really something. Yeah. So, so besides uh, TV2, what, what really impressed you this year? What did you see that really struck out? Well, the first thing that thinks comes to my mind, and this is just because I just talked to them, uh, was uh, what Sky News did mm -hmm. uh, with their video wall. Uh, you know, the video wall is a, a pretty simple idea if you think about it with just content feeding the video wall. But what they did was they took the video wall and broke it up into three modular parts that were indistinguishable, that they were separate parts mm. on air. Mm. But this allowed them to bring in various different types of stories and visualize different kinds of data. So while the presenter was up there talking about one part of the screen, they could preload another piece of the story into the center part of the screen or the other part of the screen. So he, as he just goes down the video wall, he has new information, new content, and it made for uh, a very rich storytelling, a rich way of being able to look at the different pieces of data that they had coming in from the election. I thought that was quite well done. Mm. Pata, did you no, have any favorites? No, I mean, and if I had, I wouldn't even tell you. <laughs> so, the, the, uh, so that that uh, all and any, huh? All and any. No, but yeah. I think I think the, well, what what uh, what is so impressive is the sheer breadth and wide wideness of who is doing this. Whether you look upon a TV station from the Philippines or Finland or Norway or Japan or US and so on, it's all over the place, and they're all doing something different. And they all looked uh, mm. just, just fantastic. Um, uh, I'm sure Fadi Radi in uh, Al Arabiya wants us to mention him because right. that was quite he, something. No, yeah. no, he did the world's yeah. largest AR yeah. set yeah. again. I, yeah. It was, was double the size of last. Yes, time. Yeah. and it's enormous and beautiful. Yeah. Oh, that was absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so where can can we go beyond this? What is the future 
of uh, of elections as you see it from your perspective? I, th I think uh, the drive to make sure that they convey information in an understandable way is is something that it, uh, we and the and our customers need to to stick on. And then we have something which is just going on, and that is the that you have a, a continuous line of steadily more uh, bigger resolutions uh, on mm. the screen. We're mm. getting a better signal at home with bigger screens at home. That bites for more information and more flexibility and innovation on what you can use the whole screen for. And the same goes for the, the video world. Mm. Every year they become both larger physically and have higher resolution. And um, that is just going to continue. So it becomes just even more space for us to to um, to uh, convey information mm. and use in there, mm. which is just great. And of course, the uh, the uh, the uh, combination of what we used to call the second screen, but our first screen, the one we have in the pocket, mm. uh, and what goes in, on in the studio has a lot of room for uh, for future innovation. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with what Petter said. I mean, looking at the video walls, uh, we're already starting to see uh, the video walls become more and more important in the studio to the point where uh, I could see a future where there really isn't any extra set dressing there except for the video wall. You may mm -hmm. still have an anchor desk or something like that, but it could be wall-to-wall -wall video walls so that you can change it out to be any story. It can be a football match today, mm -hmm. and then the next hour could be election coverage. And then tying that together with AR, um, you're putting a, creating a completely immersive environment. Mm. Um, but again, it's still all about the storytelling, it's still about bringing that information to the audience. So as long as they continue to be able to bring the actual facts, the news, the, the results to the audience um, in a way that is compelling and informative, mm. then uh, you know they've succeeded. Mm. I know you're not prepared for this question, Chris, but, but uh, we're talking about the election and all these emotions. And you are an American living in Norway. Mm -hmm. How has it been to, to be here and watch what's going on in, in the US and, and be so wrapped up in the uh, tech side of it? Well, I am glad to be in Norway <laughs> right now because being in the US, I feel like it would be very, very stressful being mm -hmm. bombarded with it every single day. So I can kind of have an, a detached uh, look at it from the outside. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I voted by mail and uh, I voted in Georgia, so I'm pretty sure my vote counted there, <laughs> looking at the results that happened there. Um, yeah. But uh, You have to vote uh, one more time. I have to vote again, yes, yes, yes for yeah. the, uh, the Senate seat. Um, but it is, a, it is a little bit different. It is, uh, mm -hmm. as an outsider, looking and seeing how this is impacting um, mm -hmm. people I know, my family, my friends, um, the things that they're saying on social media, mm -hmm. talking to my parents. Uh, it does. It, it, it has a personal feeling. And, you know, as I'm watching the night, I think a lot of people are just watching the night, enjoying the graphics. Oh, did you see what they did, that did. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I'm looking at the results. Right. This is something that's like, okay, how is this state going to turn? Where is uh, the Electoral College vote going to be? Uh, it's, it is a bit more tense. And I, uh, I always have my uh, emergency bottle of whiskey next to me on the election <laughs> night when I'm doing the coverage for uh, Visor T social media, just in case things take an interesting turn. This right. seems to be what he means by being detached. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Point. Yes. <laughs> We're going to round up here. So, uh, Pat Ole Jacobsen and Chris Black, thank you so much for joining me. And thank you to you who watched us today and just vote Viz. <laughs>